Thank you so much. It's a real privilege to be here because despite uh, having been through so many careers, I very much wear the biotech hat these days. And so to be in a meeting uh, like this one where um, we heard everything from the innovators to the entire edifice that keeps biotechnology moving, the, the investors, the, the patent attorneys, the people who develop the products, and then these products reach society, and that's where they will make a, a huge impact. That's what we hope. And um, that takes us to why we are here to dis what we're here to discuss, which is these breakthrough uh, innovations and public perception. Is there a gap? And uh, to discuss this, um, I have, uh, well, the organizers assembl assembled an amazing uh, panel. Um, I'll start from the end with uh, Professor Jörg Kissler. He's founding director of Institute of Biotechnology, University of Auckland. And yes, he has flown in from New Zealand. Um, next to him is Ben Herschler, correspondent for Reuters News. And Catherine Matheson is next to Ben. Um, Catherine is director of programs, uh, British Science Association. Brigitte, Brigitte, no, sorry about that, Nerlich, professor of science, language, and society, University of Nottingham. And uh, Professor George Gaskell, he's a pro-director of London School of Economics and Political Science. Um, so without much ado, I will leave you in the hands of our panelists to present. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I did come uh, from New Zealand, I'm a resident there, but uh, if you wonder where my accent comes from, I was born and educated in Switzerland, um, but have spent most of my uh, working career um, in New Zealand. Um, there initially, um, the first sort of half of at that time, uh, I was a classical uh, professor in molecular biology, um, had some wonderful research uh, around mechanisms of eye diseases, and had a lot of fun. Um, but then, 13 years ago, um, I made a very major career change, and I went into full-time academic management, and um, first became the director of the School of Biological Sciences, and then the founding director of a new institute. So uh, the vision that we developed with a team um, of people around me was that we wanted to reduce the gap between academia and industry. And the way we did, we did this was to create a new institute where we brought the companies into the building to work alongside the academics. So the current status is that we have eight companies working in the same building with um, about 150 academics. You can walk through the corridors and you will not know whether this is a company person or whether this is an academic. So you basically uh, address modern biotechnology in the sense that it has become very expensive to do research. Uh, so you share all the big facilities, you share expertise, and you really accelerate the innovation. Um, the second thing that we did was we created a new program uh, that was actually modeled on one here in um, uh, Cambridge, the Masters in Bioscience Enterprise. And I'm very happy to say that uh, several uh, uh, representatives of both programs, both in Auckland and Cambridge, are actually sitting in this room. So it's a real pleasure uh, to see. So it's a, it's a two-year master's degree where a scientist is getting a business training and understands the value chain of, of, of research and how to get it out into the community. Um, and then the third work stream really is to run workshops for industry and academics to um, run monthly networking sessions and so on, to really build an ecosystem where there is no barriers anymore. Everybody talks to everybody, new sparks fly, new collaborations evolve and so on. So that's the kind of new, good news story um, for the part of life sciences I was responsible for. Unfortunately, and that's the bad news story, um, 
we met a lot of resistance to roll it out across the rest of the university. The academics and also even senior management kind of resisted that kind of industry academic joint model um, uh, for the larger university. So the case I'm making for this panel discussion is that um, when you look around the world, uh, you will find some leading universities that are clearly leading the field in that kind of attitude change to be more open and engaging with the, the real world. And I think we're sitting in an epicenter of that you know, new, more open um, uh, attitude. But large parts of academia, including parts, large parts of my university, you know, are effectively still inward looking, very traditional. Uh, the academics don't communicate very well with the outside world. Um, they don't really connect the students with the real world. They sort of teach traditional curricula with the assumption that all of their students will ultimately become professors. Now, we know that's total rubbish because there might be five out of 100 who will get through a successful academic career, but the other 95 actually have to get a job in the real world and they're not, they're not very well prepared for it uh, in many cases. So the case I'm making is there is an education gap which starts from the traditional academic workforce that teaches the programs uh, today, which effectively shortchanges the students in the sense that they're getting the academic story but not the real world story these graduates then go into the outside world and they're not really trained to communicate very well with the rest of the world. So the case is that the education gap translates into communication gap. We're poor communicators very often. And then of course when it comes to issues like genetic modification and other kind of um, modern technologies that are perhaps a little bit more controversial, that communication gap translates into a perception gap. So effectively, as far as I make the case here, at the heart of the problem is the education gap and everything else follows. Uh, I hope that the discussion will lead to some discussion about possible solutions to bridge that gap or these gaps. Mm -hmm. So, um, as a, as a reporter, I feel I'm on the outsider here. I'm not a scientist by training. Uh, I talk to a lot of scientists who help explain what their science is all about to me, and then I try and write it down. So what I'm going to give you is a few observations, having covered the healthcare and science and biotech sector for the last decade at, at Reuters, writing for a general readership, but also a business and investor readership. Just a few observations about... Um, what, how I see the public's perception of biotechnology. And I think maybe the first thing to say is that I think in many areas, the public awareness of biotechnology is actually pretty low. And I was struck uh, by that last November. I was visiting Denmark and we drove for an hour and a half through the pouring rain from Copenhagen up to the Baltic coast. And there was this huge factory with pipes and steam and it looked like a chemical works or maybe a brewery. And, and it's actually the world's biggest insulin factory. They make half the world's insulin there on the, on the edge of the Baltic. And of course, it starts with a tiny vial of genetically modified yeast, which then gets bred up. And, and so I was pretty amazed by this. I mean, I kind of knew it was there because I cover Nova Nordisk, which is the company that makes it. But I was, came back and I was talking to a friend who is diabetic and who injects insulin every day and I told him about it. And, he was amazed as well. He didn't. He never really thought about where his injections had come from. And, and in, in one sense, why should he? I mean, this, this is a product that works. Um, and I think the first thing to say is there's a big difference between green and red biotech, so agriculture and, and uh, medical biotech. And we've heard a lot before lunch about genetically modified crops. And it's well known that there's big controversy about GMOs and with lots of headlines. Frankenfoods or superfoods in the sun today, as we were shown. Um, but nobody complains about or, or comments really on the genetically modified yeast that goes to make insulin, and nobody 
comments or complains that there's that about the genetic engineering that went into make a cancer drug like Herceptin. Um, so why is that? Well, I think the difference, and it, I, I mean, it's an argument I've heard many times, and I think it's an argument that makes quite a bit of sense, is that uh, the agricultural biotechnology is, doesn't re is, is of marginal benefit, if any benefit, to the consumer. I mean, it's, it's a, there's a benefit to the farmer, arguably, and there's a big benefit to Syngenta and Monsanto and Bayer and the companies that make it. But as I think one of the speakers earlier said, you know, we, we spend in the West a very small proportion of our income on food. So if, if the yields went up a tiny bit, it might bring our food price down marginally, but it's not, you know, it's not significant for most of us. Whereas a cancer drug or, or a, a diabetic treatment is clearly of benefit and, and, and accepted. And I think um, that's an important point to bear, bear in mind. There's also another extra factor, of course, in that green biotech has a potential environmental influence that doesn't apply when you're injecting a drug into your own bloodstream. It's uh, a confined environment. So overall, I, I would say that if you're looking at the medical biotech side of it, which, which is the, the bulk of the value of, this, of the biotechnology industry today, it's actually had quite an easy ride. From, in terms of public perception. I mean, there have been, there have been issues around, say, vaccines, but I think you could even put that to one side. There may be controversy about vaccines, but still, we've never seen vaccination rates at a higher rate around the world than today. Um, and I think that the, the biotechnology companies that, that, that are out there are, <laughs> are seen as, as generally cool. Uh, they're, they're small startups and... Um, they they get good support and good press by and large as as those small startup biotech companies, but I wonder if there aren't some risk factors coming down the the road that uh, we were thinking about. Um, so the technologies are changing. Um, we're moving into an era of of cell therapy, regenerative medicine, synthetic biology, cloning. These are all uh, technologies which are potentially groundbreaking and, and really transformative in terms of medical care, but until we actually get there, they have the potential to cause alarm and the potential sort of a yuck factor that uh, can alarm people. Um, and I'd say the other bigger issue, perhaps, and, and one that maybe we haven't really talked about here, is, is the question of price and the cost that we're paying for biotechnology medicines, and we will pay in, in future. And at the moment, most of the treatments we take are, are still small molecule pills, and most of them, are, or many of them, are now going off patents and are very cheap generics. As a result, biotechnology medicines are taking up an increasing amount of the total medicine bill. So if you look at the, num the drugs that are the top sellers in the world this year, eight of them are going to be biotechnology drugs. And they cost, I mean, this includes the monoclonal antibodies and, and some insulins, and they can cost tens of thousands of dollars a year. And that's going to be an increasing controversy. And I think you get a flavor of that from maybe the last point. Just If you go back 10 days ago, we, as someone I think said uh, the, yesterday, you know, we've, we're going through an amazing run, bull market run in the biotechnology market. But ten, 10 days ago, that came to a bit of a grinding halt, not because of any setback in science, not because of any clinical trial problem, but because of a simple letter from two law US lawmakers who wrote to Gilead, which is one of the sort of benchmark banner biotech stocks, complaining or questioning the price of their new hepatitis C drug. Interestingly, not actually a biotechnology drug. It's a small molecule. But it's, it nonetheless sparked a big sell-off in the whole uh, biotech sector. That that drug costs $80,000 for a 12-week course of treatment and... If you, if you multiply up the number of people who could potentially get it just in the United States, that could mean a $27 billion bill for the US health, healthcare system. And I think that's gonna be a big issue as biotechnology medicines become more mainstream. How do, we, uh, how do we pay for them? And particularly, how do we pay for them in the third world, in the developing world, where a disease like hepatitis C is, is particularly prevalent? Uh, hi, I'm Catherine Matheson from the British Science Association and I'm delighted to be here. Um, just briefly to explain um, 
what I do and where I've come from. I did my original undergraduate degree in natural sciences at this university and then a postgrad in science communication. And I've worked in science communication roles in quite a range of organisations, including the drug company Merck, uh, the Forensic Science Service, when that used to exist in the UK, um, and a small charity answering science questions from the public, which was great fun and quite hard. Um, so my current role is Director of Programmes for the British Science Association, which is a charity that works across the UK to try and bridge the gap between scientists and other kinds of communities. So we run one of Europe's biggest science festivals. We coordinate National Science and Engineering Week. We're very active in schools, uh, trying to do a lot to alter perceptions of science. Um, and uh, in this introduction to this panel session, I want to, I believe that a good panel um, throws up some issues, some questions for debate. So I want to challenge the idea that there's a gap between what the scientists think about these issues and what the public thinks about these issues. I think the gap is overrated. I think there is perhaps a misconception that the public, the public is very against biotechnology or is very against genetically modified food or genetically modified organisms. Um, and I think that entrenched position doesn't really cover the, uh, what's actually going on in the world. And I want to quote from a couple of recent reports about this. Um, we at the British Science Association are involved with a public attitudes to science survey carried out by Ipsos Mori, which has just been published. Sorry if I'm stealing your Sunday, I can see you <laughs> nodding there. Um, and, uh, and every few years they carry out a survey of what the public's attitudes to science and scientists are. Um, and I've just tweeted some links to these reports. So if you're on Twitter and you want to have a look, I'm uh, Kath underscore math. So you can find the, I know, very grown up. Um, uh, and the, the latest report says that more people now think the benefits of science outweigh the harmful effects compared with the same question 25 years ago. So 55% agree with that statement that the benefits of science outweigh the, effect, the harmful effects. And only 16% actively disagree. The rest are neutral or undecided. So that's quite a low proportion of the overall population who have sort of serious or fundamental concerns about the potential harms that science can bring. The survey also found that people are now more comfortable about the pace of change. Um, only a third of the populations that were surveyed says that science makes people's lives change too fast um, versus almost half when the same question was asked in 1988. 81% of people agreed that science will make people's lives easier. So I think there's a huge groundswell of public opinion, public support for science and what scientists do out there. Um, I think 40% uh, say that, um, some food for thought in here, I think, 40% of the people surveyed said that scientists are poor at communicating. That's not me. I'm not saying that about scientists. Um, if that's depressing, uh, only 3 in 10 thought that engineers <laughs> were good at communicating. And 5 in 10 said that they thought scientists were secretive which is an interesting point, I think, uh, particularly when compared with other kinds of professions, uh, doctors, politicians, journalists, um, uh, who, for whom there are also uh, data about p public levels of trust. 58% um, thought that scientists should put more effort into communicating with the public about their work, and particularly around the social implications of their work. So I think there's probably an appetite among public audiences for scientists talking more about what they do and why it's important and why they do it and what the potential benefits might be. There, is, there does seem to be a uh, dichotomy between public views of scientists working in academia and scientists working in industry. So 90% of the public trust scientists who are working for universities to follow the rules and regulations that are imposed on them, while only six in 10 said that about scientists working for com private companies. So a bit of a difference there, I think. The report also goes into more detail about um, agri-science in particular and about a number of other emerging technologies. And I would say that it suggests there is cautious support for GM technologies. So 58% um, of the people surveyed said that GM crops were necessary to increase world food production. And only one in 10 people thought there were no benefits to GM technologies at all. So it, there does seem to be uh, an appreciation of the benefits that GM technologies can offer. Um, 
I think what we're seeing in this and other surveys is that the public is actually concerned about who owns these technologies, who benefits from these technologies, and who regulates these technologies. And those, I would say, are questions about politics and about regulatory regimes, not about science per se. Interestingly, the people who said they were most informed about GM technology weren't the people who said they were most in favor of GM technology, which backs up this point that there's not a gap of understanding that I won't um, create a more, a more uh, positive climate for GM technologies, just to mix my metaphors, uh, by telling people more about the science of it. That's not what the public is worried about. They're not concerned about the science per se. They're concerned about these questions of who owns, who benefits, and who regulates. There is also a survey of public attitudes carried out by the Food Standards Agency, um, and it's worth having a look at that report as well. When the public were asked what they were most concerned about in terms of food, they said food hygiene, food poisoning, the use of additives and pesticides. GM foods was quite a long way down the list. So uh, that's my evidence for challenging the idea of a gap, and I look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Yeah, my name is Brigitte Nehrlich, and I thank you for inviting me. Um, it's really nice to be uh, back in Cambridge after a long time. So I just want to give you a little background uh, to my career because yesterday there was a discussion about leadership and being flexible in your career choices and so on. So yes, uh, I did a PhD uh, in French linguistics in, in Germany on the history of 18th and 19th century French linguistics. I then came over to Oxford uh, for three years uh, to do the other place, as, as I was called yesterday, uh, told yesterday, um, to do general linguistics. And um, then I actually taught uh, two semesters of history of uh, linguistics here at Cambridge as a sabbatical rep replacement. After that, I married, went to Nottingham, and all sorts of things happened. So in the last uh, 10 years, I have sort of started to look uh, at science communications and science society interactions, but still focusing mainly on uh, I issues of language and what I, I call framing. And I'll come back to what framing is uh, later on. Now, as I also work, I work within an institute for science and society, which is within the School of Sociology and Social Policy. So I'm also classified as a social scientist, although I sometimes don't know what I am. I have real identity problems. Um, and as a social uh, <laughs> scientist, I am asked questions like, uh, what's the relation between the general public and biotechnology, or how does uh, the public engage with biotechnology, or how should we communicate biotechnology to the public? And I always try to point out that these are really ill-formed questions uh, which have no sort of simple answers. And I just want to go through these uh, issues sort of one by one. First of all, there is no general public. There are only uh, people uh, and groups of people who have various types of values, attitudes, ideologies, stories that tell, uh, tell, tell each other, and so on. And scientists are part of that public. Martin Rees, Lord Rees, has actually said uh, uh, about a decade ago, that all professional scientists are themselves part of the public. They are depressingly lay outside their specialisms uh, amongst the main consumers of popular writings on science, and we shouldn't forget that. Now, uh, at the same time, biotechnology is not a, a homogenous uh, entity. It covers, as we have found out during this conference, a vast array of, of disciplines and uh, fields and interdisciplinary uh, endeavors that converge and diverge and so on. And all these different fields are at st various stages in, in their uh, development. Some are uh, expanding rapidly, some less so. And there are also various stages of uh, transmission or from, from bed to bench side or from uh, bench, sorry, from bench to bed side or bench to, to field and so on. So there's a, a, a lot of uh, dynamics going on uh, within uh, biotechnology. Now, sometimes under certain circumstances, tiny fractions of the public uh, so certain groups of people start to interact with tiny fractions of, of biotechnology. And this might be either because of idle curiosity, because you're interested in science and you want to know more, or it might be out of this, a, a practical need or, or desire, for example, to find out whether there's finally some stem cell therapy around that might uh, alleviate your, your mother's knee problems or whatever. So then you, you become informed about whatever you want to know about. Now, mediating between these two um, dynamic entities, which are the public and uh, biotechnology, are obviously the, the media. And again, the media are a very complex uh, and dynamic entity themselves. So uh, 
which is becoming increasingly more fragmented so that people uh, can actually latch on to exactly that type of information they want to know about, which confirms their beliefs and, uh, and so on. So, uh, and also in this moving media landscape, especially in, in online media, uh, the, the consumers of the media are becoming also producers, which we call prosumers in some circles. So again, there is a, a lot of dynamic uh, stuff going on there. So we can't just uh, talk about the media in, in, or blame the media for certain things or engage the media and so on. And that brings me to, to the issue of framing. Now, the word uh, framing is used for um, stories we tell each other through which we uh, see the world in certain ways and through which we make sense of the world. Uh, there's sort of like little tacit theories that we have about what exists, what happens, who is responsible, and so on. And these uh, framing stories are told by people, by scientists, by the media, and they all in, in very sort of um, interesting circles, actually. Um, so it's interesting to look at how uh, biotechnology or various types of biotechnology are framed by, uh, by journalists or by scientists. Scientists are becoming more and more uh, news savvy because they have to engage with the media if they want to promote their research, if they want to get the funding and so on. Every BBSRC project now, um, in a way, wants you to engage with the media or to engage with uh, uh, people. So you have to understand how framing works. Now, I just want to give you one a uh, small example of a framing device that, a device that worked really well, and that's uh, uh, the metaphor of the, the book of life. So throughout the development of the uh, Human Genome Project, we heard about reading the book of life, deciphering the book of life, decoding the book of life, and so on. And then when synthetic biology came along, we heard about writing or rewriting uh, the book of life. And now we, we hear actually about 3D printing the book of life, or even digitizing uh, the book of life. So they all, these metaphors are also dynamic and change with uh, the progression of, of, of the technology. Now, as, as you already pointed out, these metaphors can be used for good and for evil in a way, and they also can be perceived as good and as evil. It depends on who, write, who has the power to write the book of life, who controls the book of life, who uh, profits from rewriting the Book of Life in various types and shapes and forms. So uh, who, who then sort of pl uh, plays God with the Book of Life. So there are all sorts of things we can, we can talk about with this type of metaphor. And then there are other metaphors like Frankenfood and, and so on, and cloning, but I think I'm running out of uh, time here. What I want to say is that these types of framing can create uh, very deep-seated hopes and fears, which we have to be aware of. So we, we don't only engage in engineering biotechnology, we also engineer the language uh, through which we uh, communicate biotechnology. And we have to be aware not only of the ethics of the technology, but also of the ethics of framing the technology through certain types of language. And this is sort of an issue of the ethics of framing, which is being discussed increasingly in sort of communication science um, circles. So it's, yeah, that's... Me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hi, I'm George Gaskell. Um, I started life in experimental psychology and physiology. Then I became a social psychologist. I taught social psychology and research methodology for a long time. But in my research career, I have no identity problems at all. I describe <laughs> myself as an undisciplined social scientist. And what, um, with my colleague Martin Bau, we've been interested in in a theoretical sense, is the nature of common sense and how common sense changes with innovation and particularly we are interested in uh, scientific innovation. And because I'd studied physiology and uh, so forth, I thought we thought biotech modern biotechnology would be a great topic to understand how the public comes to, te to terms with the new. So for 20 years we've been looking at regulation, we've been looking at media coverage, we've been looking at public perceptions, and generally taking a view on uh, how this technology has been received into society. So I thought I might just, in my three minutes left, uh, put public perceptions in context, and particularly public perceptions of green bio biotechnologies. Um, 
GM crops and so forth. Because this has been a very contentious issue in Europe in particular over the last 20 years. Last year we saw BASIF uh, taking their research laboratory out of Germany and taking it to the United States. Actually, a very unfortunate decision, not only from the point of view of research capacity in Europe, but also they, the, the crucial thing for them was a Fortuna potato, a potato which um, has a couple of genes added from a Mexican varietal and should have been quite resistant to blight. Blight was the thing that the, um, caused the Irish potato famine in 1848. And the interesting thing there is that the Fortuna potato would need far less spraying than a traditional potato, which is sprayed about 12 times a year. And it was made mention um, of the uh, European Food Safety Authority's research, which shows that pesticide residues are indeed one of the most pressing concerns of the European public, way above GM. So we have a little problem here on what we might call relative risk assessment. You know, would this potato with its GM additions of a couple of genes present a considerable risk to anyone in particular? The scientific evidence would probably show not. And yet the benefits of reduced uh, pesticide residues might be quite considerable. But let me just sketch out some of the background to contemporary public perceptions of biotech and green biotechnology in uh, Europe. First of all, Europe has, is developing its regulatory system, and that's a problem because it's a multi-level system at the national level and at European level. Europe has over-regulated green biotechnologies, and that's largely the product of a compromise which was reached in the mid-1990s when the environmentalists said no to, modern, to agricultural biotechnology. Uh, the environmentalists in the Commission and the, uh, those in favor of modern biotechnology came to a compromise that the regulation would be on the basis of process rather than product. In the United States, regulation is on product and they have this concept of functional equivalence. A tomato is a tomato is a tomato, doesn't matter how it's made. If it looks like a tomato, it is a tomato. Whereas <coughs> in Europe, if that tomato is made through the process of genetic modification, then there's a whole different set of regulations in terms of safety, health, and so forth. Then in Europe, we have very strong environmental uh, movements, environmental politics, both at national and European level. We have well-organized non-government organizations who uh, campaign very effectively and very astutely. And if you put those against the scientific community and most of the big industries, um, the latter are, I'm afraid, somewhat behind this, the, the curve. Then we have a bit of political expediency uh, in the mid-90s, to try and get over the problem, the European Commission invented coexistence, and that was coexistence between organic, conventional, and GM crops. That didn't seem to work. So 2010, Europe, the Commission decided to uh, adopt the policy of subsidiarity, i.e. each member state could decide whether they would grow GMO crops or not. Now, this has been held up by about five countries, Germany, France, Britain, and Belgium. I can't remember the fifth. Why is it held up? Well, it's held up because, I think, few of the member states want to, want to take on the issue themselves. It's much easier to leave it in Brussels and then complain that Brussels is holding back innovation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, when if the member states decided, yes, we will have subsidiarity, we'll take decisions uh, whether we go ahead with this technology or not, the politicians don't want to do it. And then it's been made mention, first generation GM crops had very few tangible benefits for end users. The second generation is looking much more promising. Uh, 
Europe had the BSE crisis, bovine spongiform encephalitis, and that opened people's eyes to modern industrialized agriculture, and people saw it and they didn't like the look of it. And finally, food is not just the ingestion of calories. Food, in, for many people, is part of their culture and it's part of their identity. And when we start playing around with foods, we touch on the unnatural. We touch on very many things that are traditional within various societies. It's a sensitive area. Thank you. Well, thank you for these uh, insights. Um, I just want to add to uh, George's mention of natural, which was uh, an item that I thought I'd throw out before, uh, to, to the floor before opening up for questions. I, I feel like the, the concept of uh, naturalness, if that word exists, is uh, something that uh, uh, biotech technologies seem to uh, struggle with when it comes to the um, uh, adverse uh, comments from campaigners, mostly. So I wonder with, whether we can start uh, with your questions. I'd like to ask if you would uh, introduce yourself, please, and tell us where you're from and, and what you're interested in, very briefly, but just so we can uh, get to know you as well. Yes, go ahead. Thank you for your talk, Jim. I'm Anna Lewandowska from Poland, currently doing the PhD in epigenetics in Sweden. Um, when I'm going to work at the university, I at least once a week I'm reading about finding the new cancer therapy and then my mom is calling me and asking me if I still have a job or I'm supposed to come back home. But then when I'm going to the patients and I'm talking with people who are dying of cancer, they are asking me why it doesn't work if we have so many cancer therapies. So my question is how should we communicate with these uh, people about our innovations and finding the balance not to make them disappointment because most of people I knew actually passed away. Uh, I think that's a really interesting question. I think that one of the things that, um, that we might want to consider is the way in which scientists communicate about what the outputs of their work is compared to when they communicate about the processes. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of focus on communicating the outputs and often scientific research is, is reported as a series of highs and no lows, but occasional cases of fraud, maybe. Um, it, just a series of breakthroughs and triumphs, and there's very little about peer review or you know any of the other kind of day-to-day -day experiences of science. So it came through in the Public Attitudes to Science survey in that um, there seems to be some major misconceptions about how scientists work. So um, a third thought that scientists could adjust their findings to get whatever results they wanted to get. Um, which might seem funny to those of us who work in science, but there's quite a lot of work to be done there about communicating the process of science and then moving away from this kind of, it's all breakthroughs, you know, model of reporting. My uh, colleagues on the panel might have different views, I think. Well, just as someone who, who, who writes these stories, <laughs> I mean, I think that the media has to take a share of responsibility and uh, there's always huge pressure to hype a, a story. So, you know, we, we certainly have some basic rules, so breakthrough is a banned word <laughs> in our organisation, but it's, it's not in lots of media. And I think it's, it's a really complex uh, story to tell, to explain to someone how a, a, drug, a cancer drug goes through three different stages of trials, and then it's probably only going to work in a certain fraction of patients, and maybe, you know, we've now got biomarkers, and... It, it takes a lot of words to get that across, and it's hard to convey that always well in a balanced headline. And if you make it too balanced and uh, too too dry, your editors will complain. So it's a there's a constant tension there, uh, which you know, and the media is partly responsible for making sure that they don't overhype it. There's another element here um, <coughs> in that. Um, the academic world has become extremely competitive. Mm. You know, as you know, universities are being ranked on global scales, et cetera, et cetera. So 
the communication officers at the universities, uh, certainly in ours, um, you know, are constantly breathing down your neck and say, hey, have you got a story that we can give to the newspaper and so on. So what tends to happen is that as soon as somebody publishes, and I'm sure Lisa will relate to that, uh, has a paper coming out in Nature or, you know, something similar, you know, they run to the newspaper first, although they shouldn't actually, but <laughs> uh, they do. And, um, you know, they say about this breakthrough that they have just made in medicine and so on. And so the point I'm making is that we re we, we, we're making promises to the public that are still 10 years away and have a failure rate of about 90%. Um, so, you know, I think we're actually behaving very badly just in order to kind of put our reputation up as, a, as an institution mm -hmm. and we release results far too early. Mm -hmm. yeah. no, it was, it's, it's funny about the breakthrough. I, I opened my Twitter account this morning and there was a tweet from uh, the University of Nottingham, breakthrough in stem cell research, um, blah, 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 blah. And I didn't have time to read the whole uh, press release. But yes, yeah, so breakthrough is still a word that is, is used, especially by press officers uh, who want to promote the science that is carried out at an institution. But there's a, it's a really difficult balancing act uh, between um, hype, hyping something and um, getting a message across. And I've thought about actually the issue of hype a little bit. And there's something like honest hype where you, you, you write a story as a, as a journalist and you sort of, you have to ramp it up a little bit to get it across the editor. You can't say, oh, there has been a little incremental inc uh, progress in science in such and such a department. Uh, this might lead in about 10 years' time to a little bit of a, a cure somewhere, perhaps. You, you will never get past uh, the football editor or, or whatever other news is, is out there. So you, you have to write a story that grabs the, uh, the headline in, to some respect. But this is what I sort of call honest hype. And then, there's a threshold where it becomes more or less fraudulent and, and dishonest hype. And I think for journalists and for scientists who want to promote their, their science, this is a very difficult uh, balancing act to, to, to achieve between, yes, promoting or, or saying what's, what's there available now and perhaps in the future. But yes, I mean, it's, it's and then, but, but even without the media, people latch on to, uh, for example, sort of magical stem cell cures and, and go for them, even, uh, and yes, recently you, you pointed out there was a, a case in Italy where it is just something that people who are desperate for uh, a cure go for with or without the media. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's very difficult. But then you, you are in a privileged position to actually talk to your mother, and I perhaps as well, and say perhaps your knees need a little bit more time with some injections rather than having a stem cell replacement. But anyway. <laughs> You, could, oh, sorry, could you, you know, I think this also is seen in research grant applications. I mean, the average research grant application, you know, we write whatever it is, five, ten thousand words, and then what I call the two glass of claret bits come along, which is uh, what are the impacts going to be? What it, have you considered all the ethics? And then public outreach. And those are the things where I just feel, you know, you've just got to well, I have to have a couple of glasses of claret, let the ideas flow, write it late at night, and then give it to one of my assistants the next day and say, can you tidy this up? But I'm sure there is... Th this socialises scientists into exaggerated claims because you know, if you're applying in the framework programmes of the European Commission, there'll be so many points for you know, this, that, and the other, management, etc., but impacts do make a difference. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, claiming that it's the book of life, you know, that just raised, what was it, 350 million pounds from the Wellcome Trust, and, you know, that was going to solve all the problems. And at the end of the day, what did the book of life do? It showed that actually there was another rather large library behind it, proteomics, metabolomics, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, we, 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 we live periodically in hype in order to fund our research. Well, there, I think there are different degrees of hype, and I would like to come uh, out in defense of my fellow uh, science <laughs> journalists here. And um, the truth is that the newspapers have pretty excellent science coverage. 
And if you look at, at the detail of, of how, uh, uh, say, something on cloning or mitochondrial replacement, how, how it's portrayed, it's, it, it is uh, accurate, and they are careful not to hide. But there is something that most people don't know about newspapers, and uh, Ben would know uh, best, um, is that it's not the writers themselves, the science writers, who, who write the headlines. And that is where all the trouble begins, in, in my opinion. It's mostly the headline grabbing hype that uh, we object to. And sometimes I look at them and I cringe, but when I actually bother to read all, all the way down the article, it's, it's usually of excellent quality, especially here in the UK and New York Times, we're talking uh, the great publications, yeah. Good question, and thank you. What examples of this uh, headline writing? I was working with a, um, uh, um, professor was working on antimicrobial resistance, and he talked to a journalist of the Guardian, I think, uh, about uh, the battle against bacteria and the bacteria fighting back and using various war metaphors. But anyway, so he, he gave this interview, and I was quite proud of it. And then the next day, uh, the headline was War on Terror. Oh, <laughs> so, and he didn't know about this, so yeah. Quite, uh, in the middle with a white shirt. Um, so as Mr. Hersler mentioned, one of the problems the public has with biotech are the very high pricing plans that are coming out recently. And you have examples like last year, after public outcry, Sanofi cut the price of a Zoltrap drug by 50%. So this is obviously teaching the public that if you are vocal, you can't get reductions. Now, do you think there is a problem here in the perception or the education that public don't truly understand how inefficient the drug development process is and all the costs that need to be recouped? Or do you think this is just pharma and biotech really chancing their arm? Now, of course, it is a mixture of both, but I'm wondering who you think is more in the wrong here. Okay, everybody, do you want? Well, yeah, I think it is a mixture of both. I mean, the, the basic pharmaceutical pricing model has been to charge what you can get away with, because you know you've only got that limited patent life. And, and as Severin Schwann said yesterday, the model is you, you make money for that limited period, and then society gets it for free, or not for free, but for a huge discount later on. Of course, one of the interesting things with biotechnology drugs is we haven't actually seen that, whether that's going to work with biotech drugs because we have got some biosimilars, but we haven't yet got, we've got the first one launched in, in Europe for of a monoclonal antibody, but we, we don't know quite how much that's going to come down by. It's certainly not going to be as big a reduction as we see with small molecules. You know, we're not going to have 95% price cuts. So that, that's one thing. And I, th I think you're, you're right as well that the, the industry is, is inefficient in the way it produces, develops drugs. It's a very complicated business. Obviously, there's a very high attrition rate. It's not, the inefficiency is not necessarily a blame thing. You know, again, as Schwann was saying yesterday, you, know, you have to celebrate a failure because that's part of the discovery process. But um, you know, we, we did some research with, um, well, not my Part, another part of my company did some research last year that looked at uh, 12 biggest pharma companies, and it was unfortunately done on an anonymous basis, so we couldn't see which company was doing which, but they looked at this average figure of a billion dollars or $1.2 billion to produce a new drug. And when you actually look at the top 12 companies, the range is huge. So the best companies, the ones who have relatively low attrition rates, were doing it for like 300 million. And the worst companies with high attrition rates, it was costing them over three billion. So it's a question of, for the industry, you know, how good are you at, uh, at your job, basically. So, Simon Johnson, BCG. Um, before I say I'm not a scientist, so this may frame your answer to my question. <laughs> How satisfied are you with the general public's understanding of science? Do you think we've got better over time? Has it got worse over time? Do you think people actually understand what stem, what stem cells are? Do you think we understand what cloning is? Also, I mean, related to that, where does the fault lie? Is it the media? Is it an education system? Is the fault somewhere else? <coughs> I think there's a, there's a number of elements there. Um, I think the, 
it's an interesting one because, you know, Ben made the point, um, you know, when you genetically engineer insulin or, you know, various of the, the cancer drugs now, um, nobody really seems to raise much issue with it. So we just accept that this is a medicine and, you know, people get better. Um, and nobody actually really explains or has to explain the whole complexity of the science and the product development that's behind it. It's amazing. You just kind of accept it. You know, there is, I think when it comes to, uh, you know, GMO food, you know, number one, we are in a society here who have plenty of food without GMO food. So it's not really an issue. And then I think the public starts to question, you know, why do we need this? And then they kind of try to understand how this happens, you know, what's behind it. And the technology is just simply too complex. I mean, you know, I'm a scientist and even I have to kind of think pretty hard to really understand the various new cloning technologies and breeding technologies. So the point I'm making is, uh, I think it's, it's actually really, the first issue is really, do we need it? Medicine, everybody says, yep, because we know somebody who has cancer and somebody who, you know, injects insulin and so on. The food in our area, no, not immediately. So we want to understand how it comes about, but we can't, it's too complex. And then, of course, you create a vacuum in that communication, and that is very often exploited mm -hmm. by groups of people who have a certain agenda. follow up there, I would um, challenge, I think there might have been a, an assumption underlying your question. I might be wrong, but it sounded to me that there was an assumption that more knowledge, if the public had more knowledge, that would be a better thing. They would be more positive about these technologies. And I don't think that association holds true, necessarily. Um, I think in the Public Attitudes to Science survey, um, the people who knew more about genetically modified technologies um, a genetically modified food, um, knew more about the potential benefits, but also more about the potential risks. And they didn't come out in, more, in greater favor of GM technologies because of their extended knowledge. So there was an interesting piece of Canadian research that I was looking at um, as preparation for this session, which said that one of the factors which determined uh, favorability towards GM technology was the degree to which people felt personally connected to science. <laughs> They, were, they themselves were a scientist of any flavor. A member of their family was a scientist. They'd gone through a scientific training in terms of their education. Personal connections to science, that made a big difference, as did overall levels of education, not science specific, um, and um, overall levels of kind of wealth and socioeconomic um, kind of prosperity, I suppose. So I'm not sure that, that by injecting more knowledge into the public's heads, we'll get a, an atmosphere more favorable towards GM technology. Uh, but I acknowledge that might be a controversial stance. Happy to discuss. Could I, there are a number of arguments around this. I mean, one would be, say, put forward by John Miller in the United States, a famous public understanding of science advocate, and that is that science is becoming increasingly expensive, uh, science is becoming a bit political, voters, really need to know something about science in order to make informed decisions. Another approach would be, I suppose, the virtues of ignorance, that there's so many complicated things around these days, uh, we can't know everything, and we just have to rely on experts. I mean, the whole point of a, you know, a uh, complex society is that we trust experts to carry out their particular functions. You know, when you get on an aeroplane, you don't check whether somebody's been through all the safety routines. You assume that some engineer has done it. Um, and I, I, I think the third point would be, it's not knowledge, knowledge of science per se, qua the techniques that, are, that is of interest. I mean, for some people it's of interest, and for you people it's your life. I think what the public are interested in is what's going to happen with this bit of science. You know, what is stem cell research going to achieve for us? And then there's a, a moral issue. Do we think that the sanctity of life, if we believe that stem cells are 
the life in the making, or the duty of care? Which of those values, uh, when we look at them in particular uh, circumstances, do we feel trumps the other? And for a lot of people, that is a dilemma. So I think there is a level of education where people can look at what might society look like if this particular scientific innovation were implemented. Most things have pros and cons, and if people can discuss in an informed way the ethical, the moral issues, this seems to be where perhaps education can, uh, does play an enormous part. Yes, yeah, I just want to follow up very briefly. I mean, I think we should reverse our perspective sometimes. It's not so, so much about making the public understand the facts. It's for us to understand the values. So we, we have to be more in tune with what moral values are circulating, how these are framing the issues uh, or the facts. I mean, uh, a, a colleague of mine in, in America, George Lakoff, has written a book uh, where he used the phrase, facts, uh, bounds of frames. So people have certain values, biases, ideologies, and you can throw fact after fact after fact at them, in a way, or to educate them, perhaps. They will bounce off their, their, their moral or, or ideological framework. So this is a, a real, uh, I mean, facts don't penetrate them. And you have to sort of find ways of, of connecting. Um, just one thing uh, I would like to ask all of you, what do you think, because I'd like to challenge a bit of this, of the value, because sometimes I feel there's a company called Oxitec, who they make GM mosquitoes, and they are for um, um, reducing the incidence of dengue. They're, this is a horrible disease. There is absolutely no therapy at the moment. So what's happened to this company is that they've released these mosquitoes in, I think, uh, Cayman Islands, with all the proper regulatory approval, everything was above board, and they, it was a huge backlash. What, what do you think? The value is there. It is obvious for the, the locals what this value, because they are the ones affected by dengue. What should a company like that be doing? How, how, you, the, you, you are the, the future leaders, possibly, of companies like this. Do, do you think there is something more a company like that should have done, apart from getting the, the local consensus? Just, yeah. Anybody on that one? Yes, uh, go on, Peter. No, I think you're right, Lisa, in what you say. I think it's down to the local people, how they are, how the mosquitoes are managed. Um, one of the things that I'm quite surprised about by the uh, summit people that are here is that you say that more knowledge doesn't equal better results. I'm going against the green here, but I actually think the media play a vital role in teaching the general public about what we do. I mean, I think science is the best thing ever. And to be able to communicate that in a way to someone, I think you would be able to encourage more people uh, to uptake like GMOs or things like that. I'm just really surprised that a lot of people in the group are actually don't think that way. So my question would be, in regards to the hype, do you not think we need the hype in order to encourage people to actually make a positive, informed decision? Sorry. Yes. I mean, um, I was talking to people yesterday at dinner, and people asked me about better communication. But I think better communication is not a silver bullet. You have to do it in a context. You, I mean, I love science, and I sometimes I write a, a, a blog uh, called Making Science Public. I write about the Mars rover. I write about gravitational waves and, I, and the wonder of science. And it's lovely, and I love communicating that stuff. But when it comes to issues like GM or, uh, I don't know, uh, fetal programming or whatever, you, you get into a... Um, a field that is, is, is full of, of complexities and just communicating the facts in that complex situation uh, doesn't work. You have to be aware of the complexities. 
Um, oh, I mean, I have also argued sometimes that you uh, co sort of conveying the wonder of science is a sort of like an entry drug to get people <laughs> interested in science, and then they might um, be more willing to, to then also talk about more complex issues. And I, 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 I understand that too, but I, I, I don't have enough data about whether that actually works. And yeah, so I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I would love to think that just going out there and communicating the science will have this wonderful magic effect, but well, I'm more skeptical. Go on, yes. Well, I was just going to come back on your point about maybe we need more hype. And I just wanted to say, I think hype is really dangerous because it'll, it'll come back and bite you. And yeah. going back to the point about, you know, people think that, oh, there's a cure for cancer tomorrow. Well, then the drug fails and it doesn't work. And, and if you go down the hype road, you end up, you know, the Daily Mail view of the world where everything either causes or cures cancer. And, you know, that's just, I think it's dangerous and you, you've got to be careful and... I, I kind of, that's a constant argument and battle we have when we're writing because we've got to try and make it interesting but correct and the, there's a tension there. But there's a difference, the dif no difference between hype and wonder, maybe. You know? yes. I think you think you can be inspired and think things that you can admire the wonder of science or biology or physics. That's not just, that's not hyping a particular end result, is it? It's So it's also kind yeah. of a comment on um, this misrepresentation of science and mistrust. So I think part of the mistrust comes from the fact that we do hype science and people don't trust scientists because we say things and then don't follow through. So people claim that we can do these great things with science and then, and then never actually manage to achieve it. And that's probably one of the reasons people mistrust us. But um, in terms of, you know, the responsibility of the media in this, I think one of the problems is what we scientists consider and what media considers a fair representation. So if there is an issue, so the, the big mediatized issues of vaccines and stem cells and GM, for the media, uh, a balanced view is a person for and a person against. Even though in the scientific community, it's thousands of people for and one person against. And it gives a voice and it gives credibility to extreme thinking that isn't necessarily representative of the science. So what are your Good thoughts on, on that? I mean, that, I'm observing this at the moment in the climate change discourse. And there's a lot of debate in the BBC about um, balance uh, and uh, actually where balance leads to bias. And so there's a lot of research on, on, on these issues. Where was, there was a BBC report on, on balance and so on. Yeah. So people are trying to grapple with this. But when I then look at uh, Radio 4 um, um, getting uh, Lord Lawson uh, on a climate change program together with a climate scientist just to have the balance right between a skeptical and a, a pro-climate person. So yeah, it, 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 it's a difficult thing to do. And then again, with MMR, there was certainly a big issue around this, uh, this balancing out of, of opinions. But I think there are, there's more and more awareness about the negative effects of this on, on audiences. So I think the broadcasters are, are dealing yeah, with this. I think it's a real it's a real issue, and the, and the whole fair balance question is something that I think a lot of science journalists really pushing back against. You know, there's, there's a, there's, you get pressure from the central editing desk basically to get that balance in, and then you have to say no, there there isn't a debate on this. And I think eventually you move on. I mean, I remember writing about HIV back in the early 90s, where there were still a few mavericks who were arguing this is not caused by. Yeah. AIDS is not caused by HIV, and there was an argument as to whether or not we should incorporate that argument into our stories. 
and I, I think you know we've it, it, it died out quite quickly, but there was a time in the early 90s when that was reported. Now, no one would dream of saying that. So that's gone that fair balance are, and I'm sure the same will happen with climate change. <laughs> Thanks. I, I just uh, my name is Neil Weir, um, and I just wanted to add to some of what the panel said, and generally agree with them. Although I'm surprised I find myself agreeing. Uh, I think it's not really a surprise that we have a challenge communicating, because so even in my job, if I'm trying to communicate to a board who are actually generally minded towards agreeing with you, it's sometimes very very difficult. And the frustration is that you think, well, aren't you getting it? And sometimes the temptation is to give ever more facts, and that generally doesn't get you anywhere. I think it's exactly as Brigitte said, that actually giving the principle and giving some general concept around how close you are or how likely that is, I think, in my experience, often gets you further than actually just going to hard facts. Because I think even as scientists, if we're sort of trying to work out between two outcomes and two options, as we reveal one level of information, we side with one side, and then we reveal another, and then we go the other way, and then we get some more data, and we go with it back the other way. So, you know, for the recipient, it's actually genuinely very, very difficult to just use straight facts because they're not using them in the same way as, as the scientists who, who understand it. So I, th I think I agree that generally pure facts are not always particularly helpful. It's, it's sort of sharing ambitions and concepts, and, but also being very honest in sharing how likely you think that is to, to achieve it sharing uncertainties as well. So, the gentleman in the grey suit. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, my name is Jane Comerford. I run the Cambridge Science Festival. Um, so I'd like to thank Catherine. I enjoy reading those reports every other year. Um, so well done for keeping that up. It's really helpful. Um, We've had a lot of discussion that basically is talking quite a lot of those things that ha were um, put in the Walter Bodman report that we all probably read uh, about public understanding of science. It's increasing the knowledge. Um, and we've had lots of discussions about how that necessarily isn't very helpful just to give more facts out into the public sphere. And so I might put to the panel the question of how do we encourage pe people to engage in science and technology in a very deep way? And people sometimes might find out um, different aspects of what it is to be a human by reading poetry, seeing opera, reading books, and engaging with people in a much more culturally specific or playful way. And if people have the facts interspersed with real life meaning and a way to kind of interact with it in a sort of um, intellectual and playful level, how does the panel think maybe that those kinds of methods might be a little bit more useful than just presenting a lot of trivia to the public. Tell us about Hollywood then. <sighs> oh, sorry, this reminds me. I think, oh, I think David Willits, or some, I don't know, there was a report about, for, for BIS, no, not a supporter report, a more recent report um, about public engagement with, with science, where it actually recommended scientists to become engaged with Strictly Come Dancing. Has anybody read this? <laughs> Uh, so, um, and that made me, so, no, I completely agree with you that um, playfulness and, and integrating the scientific information into a, into a, a humane you know, art-science connection is, is really good. But there is, again, a point where it becomes uh, ridiculous. But, yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> Exactly. No, no, I know. <laughs> and, and again, I mean, it, what I would say is science is also <laughs> playful, and we, we play with ideas, and it's not just sort of a serial linear process where we sort of do one thing after the other, uh, and then the outcome comes out and booms, we have a, a, a miracle drug. So I think uh, we have to also convey the, the whole. Uh, as you say, the process of science, which is based on, on, on curiosity, playing with ideas, um, messing about, uh, seeing what comes out, and so on, rather than 
giving this purified image of science, which people then think is the reality. And I think that's also something which we have to sort of avoid. Yeah. Can I come in quickly? Um, and I, uh, I have a huge amount of respect for the Cambridge Science Festival, and there are also other excellent quality festivals taking place all over the world now, which is a fantastic <laughs> situation to be in. And I would encourage everyone here to take a, play an active role in science festivals wherever you are, because I think there's something about the immediacy um, and the kind of levelling of being a scientist and, and family groups or members of the public that um, from on both sides is really refreshing and enjoyable and really effective. So people who go to science festivals often go back again and again because they enjoy it, they find it informative. Um, and the scientists love it. I'm sure you'll agree with me that, that scientists um, love taking part. It's, it is great fun. Um, one of, the, um, one of the things I'm getting more and more involved with at the moment is a slightly different kind of um, public engagement with science, often called citizen science. Mm. So uh, driven by um, uh, increasingly powerful online technologies, um, I suspect, uh, giving ordinary members of the public, if there is any such thing, ordinary members of the public the opportunity to take part in scientific research projects, doing things that scientists would do. So the uh, classic example is Galaxy Zoo, inviting members of the public to classify galaxies based on their visual appearance, which you would not think that members of the untrained public could do, but they can do it very well, actually. Um, and the Galaxy Zoo team have developed algorithms for making sure that they get um, larger numbers of observations from volunteers, such that the data is publishable in the regular astronomy journals. Um, and this is taking off hugely, so I'm aware of, uh, I don't know, 20, 25 different citizen science initiatives at the moment, and there are more coming along all the time. Uh, the classic ones in this area are probably Fraxinus, which is um, inviting the public to help identify the genetic sequence of ash dieback oh, yeah. um, organism. Uh, and the Cancer Research UK Cell Slider, app, which is inviting members of the public to help classify cancer cells uh, from micrograph slides, microscope slides. Um, I think this is a hugely rich area for development because um, the people who are getting, I mean, they're, they're totting up huge numbers of people getting involved in this. Um, and I think um, there is genuine science that can be done here as well as a genuine public engagement goal. Uh, thanks a lot. I'm really enjoying this discussion. Um, I would like to set the context of my question by going back to what the question Lisa asked. If I were to deploy um, the mosquitoes designed to get rid of dengue, well before they were ready, I would definitely put a team in that area to just understand what dengue means for the people over there before going there and saying, hey, I have this cool new technology and I can improve your lives. So with that context, the question I have uh, for you guys is, in your professional expertise, when you decide whether a story is supposed to be deployed in the media, uh, what makes the go-no-go -no -go decision? Is it, is, it, is it, no, I don't need the trade secret, but what I'm getting at is, when we're trying to make the public aware, is there, any, um, is there any market research, so to say, to understand what is it that the public wants to know? Or is the scientific expertise saying that this is what public should know? I'm not sure if I'm putting across my point properly. I could try another way. That's a good question. <laughs> because then we are kind of giving just a filtered number of stories mm -hmm. and not giving the, and maybe the public wants to ask something else, but they just know what we tell. But, but the pub, okay, the public, I'm sorry, members of the public uh, normally get their <coughs> initial knowledge of what's sort of going, bubbling up in science from the media. So it's a bit, of, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite difficult to go then to the public and ask them what they want to know because what they want to know is what they read about. So, oh, or what they, yes, you see I what mean, I mean? Off, off the top of my head, social media would be a good way to track as to what people are really interested in knowing rather than saying that, okay, this mm. is this really cool lab, they're going, doing re good research, people should know about it, but maybe people don't want to know about it. They want to know about something else. Mm. I mean, I can't speak to... What you're asking, thanks. What, what she's asking is that whether it makes sense to ask the people whether they understand it and whether they actually see the benefit by running kind of pilot study with such technology to avoid uh, backlashes and failures. Did I get you right? Thank you. Yeah. I don't know that. Sorry. Uh, so I was going to say quickly that um, 
I'm aware that the government um, and government-owned research agencies do quite a lot of that consultation and deliberative dialogue kind of work with public audiences to find out what they already know about a particular area and, crucially, what they say they want from it, from a particular area of research. So if you're interested in that, you could have a look at the ScienceWise website, which is the government's consultation programme. I don't know how well that happens in the media. No, I mean, I, I mean, I can't speak to you know the process of what when a scientific institution decides to put out a story. Um, or like, uh, but what I, my hunch is that they try and get as much press as they possibly can to promote their own institution and therefore their financial security in the future. I mean, it's maybe worth, might be interesting to know that you know we get every week, I, I must be two or three hundred press releases. Just, I mean, and then there's many more that don't come to me, but I probably see two or three hundred press releases from science institutions on on the back of various papers. Most of them we don't look at at all. You know, we're they're they're in small journals and they're they're minor bits of news that we don't think anyone will be interested in. But there's a huge amount of PR. There's a huge PR machine pushing science stories, and only a small fraction gets into the papers. The PR is always always one way. Sorry. So, what you said there is the PR machine behind it, but it always but PR works only one way, and social media, for example, works in two ways because it gives the yeah. opportunity to interact. I think there is a gap for social sciences as a step between the life science or life science based technology and the society to make it happen, and that's to, that's why the, the example you've, you've given uh, that's why in this example it didn't work. Oh, it's working. It's on its way, but it's had a b it's had a bit of backlash from okay. environmentalists and so on. So there's the an opportunity, perhaps, to intervene in a different way with how the information is rolled out. The locals were convinced. That's why it went ahead. So they had done this prepara preparation uh, in terms of information, but still, it's the. Um, the, the usual campaigners, the NGOs, these, these who, uh, we, we, they're very vocal and they're very emotional. They use uh, uh, different strategies to put their information across. So I'm wondering whether we as scientists, we don't usually use these sorts of emotional terms, but I'm wondering whether maybe we ought to. I don't know, just a, an um, idea. I, yes. I, I quite like your statement about the one-way versus a two-way communication. And there's one point we're kind of missing here a little bit. And because we're constantly talking that our communication media is the newspapers and the press and the TV and all that kind of thing. I think every scientist mm -hmm. is a unit of communication. Mm -hmm. And this is the point I made earlier on, is you know, if the scientist was educated to communicate the value of what they're doing, in terms that the lay person, the community, actually understands it, then I don't know what the demographics is, how many scientists we have per, per capita, you know, but it's a fair number. So if all of us were going to go around and actually talk you know, about what we are doing and, and, and share that enthusiasm mm -hmm. and the relevance of, for society of what we are doing, then that would be a large part of the information flow, which actually goes two ways, because you can then ask me a question and then I can explain it. So I'm, I'm totally with you. I like the two-way <laughs> approach much better. George, go ahead with your question. Can I, can I just ask you a question? My guess is most of you are working in the life sciences and nature biotechnology is something you read, and if you could get a paper in nature biotechnology, that would be brilliant. How many of you read nature materials? Oh, really, quite a few. Impressive. Sorry, you've just confounded my expectation. <laughs> I, was, I was going to explain, and I asked that question on the basis of my next door neighbor, who, the late uh, Morris Wilkins, who was involved with Crick and Watson. And I would talk to Morris regularly, and he would say about what I was doing and you know, various things that we were looking at with respect to biotechnology, and Morris would say, oh, completely outside my field. I mean, he had a very very specific area of expertise and he was vaguely interested in other things but would never express an opinion on them 
because he was, wasn't the specialist. So I was going to try and you know, demonstrate that you people, like the general public, have certain areas where knowledge is a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. When it becomes an end in itself, then you read the entire 10 or 12 different nature publications uh, just because it's all so fascinating, it's all science. But I guess, you know, we have time constraints. The members of the public have time constraints. They have families to bring up. They have jobs to do. They have going to school and being governors and this sorts of thing. And, you know, if time didn't have a value, if we had infinite time, I'm sure people would be more interested in not just science, but music and culture and et cetera, et cetera. But sadly, there's only 24 hours in a day and eight of them we probably spend subconscious. And 10 minutes left. So well, I'll take two more questions and then our panel will make us a little summary. So please. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm Manuel. I'm a PhD student in tumor immunology in, at the EPFL in Lausanne. And I was actually wondering whether maybe one underlying uh, issue that we have common to all this is the rewarding system that we have in, in science, because actually what I think is, uh, me as a scientist, I'm actually re rewarded for overselling my science, right? I do want to <laughs> publish potentially nature, science, whatever, and my boss does so as well. So, you know, maybe we shouldn't blame the media that much, but... <laughs> ourselves and I'm actually asking maybe I'm wondering in, if you in your institute since you put together academia and um, uh, industry probably you have also another system of, of rewarding people apart from just having you know first authorship publications um, I wished um, the we, we go by the general university of course guidelines and so on so uh, but uh, you make a very important point because I have been lobbying very hard with senior management you know to really kind of encourage an incentive structure that will change attitudes and you know th there's a lot of things that you can do you could, could say on average every academic group should be doing basic research and applied research and you're funding it accordingly you know and the two things go together the students then would have a choice whether they want to work on a basic you know nerdy kind of uh, subject if you like where there's no direct outcome or one that directly has outcomes you know then the whole uh, the, the whole um, research assessment kind of exercise I believe this country has one to the R RAE or whatever it's called these days. You know, we have that in New Zealand as well. Well, what are they measuring? They're measuring for every academic, you know, how many publications, what's the impact factor, how many grants, you know, and so on. But they're not really measuring how many contacts to the industry and or the community, if you like, you know, does this academic have, you know, how many patents, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what you're saying is, yes, it's deeply in my, close to my heart, is that to bring that attitude change, you know, we have to set expectations. I know it's a dirty word in academia where everything should be free thinking and free wheeling and so on, but I believe you do have to actually manage expectations. And behind that is an incentive structure where you're saying, you know, if you're not the guy who is publishing in Nature and impact factor 30 you know, type journals or whatever, but you're actually creating some patents and, and you, you're collaborating with industry and we also reward that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's my goal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so help me achieving it. <laughs> but, but the impact agenda is doing that. I mean, sorry. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, the impact agenda, or the, the, the REF plus impact agenda, I mean, actually rewards patenting and so on, and, and creating... It's a good step forward, yeah. Exactly, new, new widgets, which sometimes for me as a social scientist... And, and social impact, exactly, and social impact, but which is quite difficult to, to measure unless you have sort of uh, influence <laughs> policy and so on. <laughs> but yes, creating social widgets is, 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 is my goal, but anyway, no, <laughs> I haven't quite achieved that. But... Um, so yeah, so I think there is now a, a double way of, of um, 
uh, being valued. I mean, I, I'm just a, uh, an anecdote. My, my husband is a social psychologist, and uh, he, he did a lot of applied research in, in car, uh, looking at car accidents. And for a while, he was always regarded as a sort of the, the, the black sheep in the uh, psychology department because it wasn't, he wasn't publishing in the Journal of Experimental Psychology or whatever highly uh, valued journal you could publish in. Now the, the ref came around with impact, uh, and he could show he had influenced exactly. this type of advertising uh, uh, advert around motorcycle accidents. He had influenced this type of policy and so on. Suddenly, he became the golden boy of the department, uh, despite the fact that he hadn't published these high-impact journals. But he had studied real impacts, you know, between cars. <laughs> so uh, there is this sort of value change going on, which is quite interesting. Yep. And, you know, I'd just like to make the point when I'm saying on average, they, what, what it acknowledges is that some areas of research are less amenable you know, to that kind yes. of applied research <laughs> and others are more. So all I'm saying is that on average the aim should be that everybody has a balanced portfolio. So we've run out of time but our panelists will be here so if you have questions I'd encourage you to come up and say hello and you can ask them your questions if you have any left. Sorry if I didn't uh, pick you. Um, but now I'd like uh, each of our panelists to um, perhaps sum up any wild thoughts on how, if this gap exists or should it exist, what, what could be done uh, to, to plug this gap? I'd like to start. Well, if we go the, the normal sequence. Um, yeah, well, I mean, uh, I, I really... Uh, propose that uh, the, the focus should be on changing attitudes in what is still to a large part, and I would exclude the current the university we're sitting here, but uh, to a large part what I have seen around the world is still some sort of a traditional ivory tower attitude which looks very much inwards rather than outwards. And so where I think we need to jump the gap is by changing attitudes in academia and uh, start to realize a little bit more why are we doing this, why does the taxpayer actually invest in us, what are we giving back to society. And I was absolutely over the moon when I heard your vice chancellor here yesterday start off his welcome speech, here is our mission goal, we solve societal problems with excellence, excellence in research. Great. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> so, yes, well, I, I mean, I think there is a, a perception gap um, and I think it would be great if there was more wonder about biology in a way that maybe there is with physics at the moment. Um, but I'm not sure, I think, I'm not sure it's a huge obstacle necessarily. I mean, I think um, people will, the society will accept and embrace new technology when it delivers. And, you know, going back to the point about insulin and cancer drugs and, you know, the new technologies like stem cells are being tried and tested now. And if we have a stem cell treatment that cures blindness, I think the public will embrace it. Uh, yeah, I agree, actually. I think in terms of the um, relevance to public audiences that this area of science offers, it's immense. And um, with the greatest of respect to physics, it's a lot more relevant to people's everyday lives than most of physics ever will be. So. Um, uh, I think I think the gap is overhyped, <laughs> as you know, but I think there's still a great deal to be done, and I would encourage us to think of public engagement as being a part of every scientist's job, um, as much as research excellence is. I think that's increasingly being recognised in academia, but less so in industry, so there's quite a job to be done there, I would say. I think, to quote Paul Nurse, Paul Nurse talks about... Um, the public giving scientists their license to operate, uh, which goes back to, to what my colleague was saying about what we're doing with taxpayers' money, how we explain that and how we defend that. Uh, and as I say, I think there's a role for all of us uh, in communicating with the public on those issues. Yeah, I, I, I think we might want to res, uh, sort of reflect more about certain uh, preconceptions we have about, as I said, the, the general public, that's, and these preconceptions circulate among scientists and policymakers, and I think they may contribute to rather sort of cons confused policymaking. So, for example, I think um, Anne Glover uh, talked about uh, GM madness and hysteria, and as, as you say, there is perhaps less of that uh, than 
policymakers might actually think. And I know from, from nanotechnology, for example, that there's actually a little evidence for um, a sort of turning away from nanotechnology by the general public, but there's evidence of companies sort of anticipating that they will turn away from it and then acting accordingly in, in terms of their preconceptions about what will happen. So I think we have to question our preconceptions about various um, issues around the public, I think, more, including the gap. <laughs> Look, it seems to me that uh, the base sciences, biotechnology, nanotechnology, synthetic biology, they open out an enormous range of possible avenues for research. Uh, biotechnology is, because it's the sciences of life, much more sensitive than many other technologies. But it's notable that the nanotechnologists, I mean, in the uh, late 90s and into the, uh, I, I guess, up to about 2004, there was a great deal of discussion about nanoparticles, et cetera, et cetera, where they're going into the food chain. And what have the nano people done? They've avoided controversial areas. Nobody talks and worries about nanotechnology at the moment, it seems to me and that goes right across Europe. So it seems to me, if you'd look back over the last 20 years, the develop, many developments of biotechnology have just been, you know, more or less applauded or quietly accepted. GMOs are the exception. And, you know, if you were a commercial company making motor cars, and you made a motor car in 1996, and it had, you know, some crazy, uh, adaption to it, which nobody liked, you probably wouldn't be still making the same sodding motor car, a bigger problem, the same motor car 20 years later. You'd say, that innovation isn't a runner. The public don't like it. So, you know, science is a commercial business. I know it's the pursuit of knowledge, etc., etc., but it's still commercial. And it seems to me some of the assumptions that underlie the success of commercial companies in terms of their product lines could well be applied to science. But my general view is the problem isn't a gap period. The problem is there's a difference between the scientific community and certain sections of the public and certain environmentalists and other on the costs and benefits of GMOs. Most of the other innovations that one reads about out of biotechnology have been unproblematic. Thank you. And um, before we end, I'd just like to say, in my, in my opinion, is that uh, gaps open up and close um, with different frequencies, different. What will make a difference, you, all of you, you are the learned biotech minds, in, in my opinion. Go to social media, tweet, blog, be engaged. That really will make a difference. And with that, I'd love to thank uh, our wonderful panel. Thank you.